and how to fix them. That is organized jointly by the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung and IPES Food. My name is Jan Urhan and I coordinate the food sovereignty program of the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung that is based in Johannesburg in South Africa. The Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung is an internationally active, progressive nonprofit organization for political education. And since its foundation in 1990, the foundation has been engaged in the analysis of social processes and developments. Through its teams and 27 regional and country offices across the globe, the foundation works with hundreds of partner organizations, political actors, and individuals in over 80 countries worldwide. The aim of the foundation's work is to strengthen eman emancipatory political forces, and one of the topics we're working on is food and agriculture. IPES Food, the International Panel of Experts on Sustainable Food Systems, is an independent cross-disciplinary panel of scientists and experts shaping debates on how to transition to sustainable food systems around the world. Today's online event is on rising prices for food and hunger and how to tackle this current situation. World food prices hit record highs in March, April um, 2022, impacting food insecure countries and populations very hard. This third global food price crisis in 15 years was sparked by Russia's war on, of aggression on Ukraine, but it has been fueled by persistent underlying flaws and fragilities on which our food systems are based, such as import dependency, for instance, and excessive commodity um, speculation. In this online event, we take stock of the critical factors fanning the flames of global hunger. And we will provide concrete policy prescriptions of what can be done to relieve this food price crisis now, and also to create more resilient food and agricultural systems in uh, the long term. A last technical remark, um, you are invited to ask questions to the speakers via the Q&A tool. Uh, please also indicate to whom you would like to ask the question. Please use the chat uh, for technical questions only. We will take questions and comments in, in writing only. Um, and we will also record uh, today's um, online event. I am very pleased to introduce today's speakers. Uh, with us today is Michael Fakri, the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food. He is also a professor at the University of Oregon School of Law, and his expertise is not only in human rights, but also in trade and development. Welcome, Michael. I would also like to introduce Jennifer Club, IPES Food and Professor of Global Food Security and Sustainability at the University of Waterloo in Canada. Uh, Jennifer Club is a Canadian political economist and an expert on food security. She is vice chair of the United Nations Committee on World Food Security's high level panel of experts. Her research and book writing focuses on how international economic policies can better foster food security and environmental sustainability goals. Welcome. Our third speaker is Nada Chugui from the Tunisian Observatory of Economy and member of the North African Food Sovereignty Network. Nada is a Tunis-based Tunis political economist, graduated from Tunis, from Tunis uh, Business School. She co-founded the Observatory for Food Sovereignty and Environment in 2017 and worked with the Action Group of Food Sovereignty. She also worked as Parliament Observer with Al Bavswala, a Parliament Monitoring NGO, as a journalist with Bar Al Aman, research media, and worked on issues related to social and economic justice, food sovereignty, and also consumer um, organizing, as well as social movements. Welcome, Nada. Last but not least, it's a real pleasure to welcome Maya Takachi, Regional Program Leader for FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, Latin America and the Caribbean. Maya has more than 20 years of experience in research and public policymaking in the area of food security and nutrition, nutrition, rural development, social protection and smallholder farming. She is specialized in public policies, 
She has a PhD in economic development and worked in the implementation of the Zero Hunger Program in Brazil. Previously, she worked as advisor of Brazil's president of the Republic from 2005 to 2010, as national secretary for food security and nutrition in the Ministry of Social Development from 2011 to 2012, and as agriculture researcher linked to the Ministry of Agriculture from 2013 uh, to 14. She joined then FAO as a senior social protection officer and deputy strategic program leader for reducing rural poverty at uh, the FAO headquarters in Rome from 2015 to 2019 and is currently the regional program leader for, for regional office in Latin America and the Caribbean. Jennifer will start uh, with a keynote and present, and present the main findings of the report, Another Perfect Storm, that was recently released by IPES Food. Afterwards, we will have two or three rounds of questions and comments among the panelists before we open up the discussion and the debate with everyone present at this online event. Uh, Jennifer, um, we're all looking forward to listen to your uh, keynote speech and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jan, and I will share my screen and just wanna make sure everyone can see. Yes, excellent. Well, th thank you very much for the invitation to be part of this important discussion today uh, on the food crisis. And I'm very honored to be invited to speak among such an impressive uh, group of panelists and I look forward to the discussion. Um, I, I will present some of the analysis from the recent IPES food report, Another Perfect Storm, as Jan mentioned, um, which I worked on alongside my outstanding colleagues at IPES food. And um, given that this is a 15 minute presentation in order to maximize discussion with the panelists and with the audience, um, I will focus my, uh, just my remarks on the analysis of the problems in food systems that led to the crisis uh, having such wide consequences. And I will also offer some of my own reflections on the current policy context. So as, as we all know, the current food crisis unfolded quite rapidly with the Russian invasion of Ukraine causing huge interruptions to global food supply chains for grain, oil seeds, and fertilizers. And this occurred on top of food price inflation that had already been happening the previous year, uh, which itself resulted from earlier disruptions to global food supply chains because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And since the conflict began, food prices have hit record highs and have continued month on month at very high levels, although they were already high uh, before the war began, as I mentioned. The, the countries most affected in this current crisis are low income countries that depend on food imports, uh, in particular countries in the Middle East, North Africa and East Africa. And although we know this crisis is already bad, we should be uh, cognizant that things could actually get worse. Uh, the conflict has already gone on quite long and it could go on for longer. Uh, we know that uh, last year there were droughts in key grain producing areas and there's concern this may happen again. And if there are continued disruptions to trade because of export bans, this can also exacerbate uh, the situation. So it's a very uh, fluid moment uh, in terms of the global food situation. Uh, and it is already a crisis and we need to be, um, we, need, we need to understand it uh, if we wanna respond appropriately. As, as Jan mentioned in the introduction, um, this most recent crisis is actually the third global food price crisis in just 15 years. And the outcome of this crisis is, is unfortunately predictable. Many millions of people will starve due to these disruptions. And according to the UN Global Crisis Response Group, around 200 to 300 million people are already at risk of severe acute food insecurity. The crisis is of global proportions, but it didn't have to be as severe as it has become. We are not in a crisis of production, at least not now. Uh, we know that the world produces enough food to feed everyone uh, an adequate and healthy diet. And a large, and, but we also know that a large proportion of agricultural production goes to non-food uses, such as biofuels and livestock feed. So it's not a crisis of production. Uh, the crisis, rather like previous crises before it, it's a crisis of access, a crisis of unsustainability, and a crisis of instability and unhealthy diets. But we can't rule out, as I said, the, that the future productivity may also be affected. 
But in short, this is a major food crisis that's affecting all dimensions of food security. As we argue in the IPES food report, the collapse of food security uh, at this moment is the product of structural flaws in the current food system that undermine its resilience. It, it's created a situation where disruptions caused by war can turn into a full-blown food security crisis. The four uh, key structural flaws in the, food in the global industrial food system that we identify are first food import dependencies. And in many ways, um, these dependencies, as I'll talk about, they've been longstanding, uh, but as they get more, as the system gets more and more concentrated and these dependencies continue, small triggers can cause huge problems. And the, the situation is exacerbated by the fact that production systems globally are very entrenched and it's very difficult for them to adjust when, when a trigger sparks a cascading effect of a crisis. So that's the second structural flaw. The third is opaque and dysfunctional grain markets, including commodity speculation that is causing price spikes. So, you know, we've got a trigger, we've got a difficulty adjusting, and then prices go haywire uh, on markets. And this is exacerbated by the fourth structural flaw, which is the vicious cycles of conflict, climate change, and poverty, uh, causing food insecurity among the most marginalized peoples uh, in the world. And so this, this, this is a four structural flaws that we focus on in the report uh, that we, we single out as, as making this particular crisis uh, particularly uh, problematic that allows the invasion of Ukraine to basically become a full-grown uh, food price crisis. So the first flaw um, that I want to spend a bit of time on is that these dependency, that there are import dependencies in the world. And these these kinds of import dependencies obviously have been uh, in existence for some time. Uh, and they have, they have roots in the erosion of traditional diets. Uh, and the world now depends on just a handful of staple grains for 40 to 50% of human diets. And this erosion of traditional diets is a product of a focus on staple crop production since the colonial period in many, in many low-income countries, uh, as well as in-kind food aid uh, from Western donors since the 1950s and 60s, including wheat, uh, which was often given in kind um, to, to low-income countries in the hopes that these countries would become commercial importers of grain. But it created some dependencies. Uh, and today, many low-income countries are highly dependent on food imports for a high proportion of their basic staples. Uh, as the graphic here of, um, from UNCTAD shows, that many countries, uh, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, have a high degree of food import dependency. And these dependencies uh, became more entrenched in the 1980s when many countries were advised by international financial institutions to specialize in cash crops for exports to repay their debts. Uh, and they ended up doing so, but in, in effect then began to import grain from global markets, uh, the production of which was often highly subsidized. So these dependencies then have become quite deep um, and, and this is problematic when you have disruption on, on world markets. But there's a second layer of dependency, and that's a dependency on um, that the dependency is that the global grain markets themselves are highly concentrated. And so those importing countries are dependent on just a handful of exporters. So according to USDA data, for example, um, just seven countries plus the European Union account for nearly 90% of the world's wheat exports. And just four countries account for over 80% of the world's maize exports. And these are major staple grains. Uh, so the trade in these products is dependent on just a few countries and regions uh, of the world. And we also know that just four companies, what are called the ABCDs, that's Archer, Daniels, Midland, Bungie, Cargill, and Louis Dreyfus, control anywhere from 70 to 90% of the global grain trade. And we don't know the precise number because these are um, not all publicly traded companies, and there's very little data on this, but most estimates put it in, within this range. And this, so this is a very high degree of concentration and dependence on just a few actors. And this leads to very inflexible global markets. And the situation is exacerbated by the fact that several dozen exporting countries uh, have basically imposed export bans uh, in recent months. Um, in the face of the crisis. So this often happens when food prices start to spike 
and countries that may export some of their crop are seeking to ensure that food prices don't get out of control domestically. So they prohibit the export of, of those crops. But this kind of action can further constrain the availability of grain on global markets and can lead to more instability on markets by pushing prices higher. Um, and so this affects food import dependent countries even more. So this second layer of dependency uh, is quite an important one to, to understand in addition to uh, import dependency in general. So that's the first major structural flaw that we focus on. The second one is, is basically the, the entrenched nature of production systems, which have effectively locked in agricultural production of specialized commodities destined for export markets, which makes it very difficult uh, for producers to shift production to foodstuffs for local markets. Uh, so this, this crisis is one, this, or sorry, this flaw is one that prevents systems from responding when, when triggers cause um, disruptions. And it, it takes um, the form, for example, of specific farms and specific regions tend to specialize in certain crops that may be locked into specialized equipment, infrastructure and skills. And there can be considerable investment in, the, in this infrastructure and equipment, for example, that makes shifting gears quite difficult. Uh, some regions also have policies that reinforce a focus on just a handful of crops. Uh, so for example, agricultural subsidies for the production of certain crops or even biofuel mandates. It makes it difficult for farmers to change gears and plant different crops. And there's also a preference of, of buyers and investors for standardized crops. So for example, wheat, maize, and soy that are traded on commodity exchanges. Uh, again, this makes it difficult for producers to shift gears and, and plant different crops. And many of these standardized crops that are grown in industrial fashion are heavily reliant on uh, synthetic fertilizers, agrochemicals, uh, and other expensive inputs. Um, for example, maize is one of the highest users of fertilizers. And so these production systems are locked into high energy use and high costs. So this is the second important structural flaw we need to understand that's preventing food systems from being resilient and responding uh, in the face of a disruption. The third structural flaw is the opaque and dysfunctional nature of global grain markets. Uh, as I noted at the outset, we are not in a crisis of supply, at least not at this moment, uh, but prices have really spiked quite sharply in the context of conflict. And we are seeing now growing evidence of excessive speculation on international commodity markets, where investors have rushed in to buy futures contracts in, and we've seen a huge volume of trades that have accompanied uh, rising food prices. And this has pushed food prices up further beyond what supply and demand would normally dictate. Uh, and there are other signs um, that this is a, a excessive speculation taking place. I'll just briefly mention uh, what these are. Um, there's strong evidence that investors have moved in en masse uh, to cash in on rising food prices by buying into retail uh, financial products such as exchange traded funds that specialize in wheat and in maize. These are basically derivatives that are based on um, the prices of uh, on the futures markets. And it's a secondary level of investment that's going on. So you've got the futures tr traders and the speculators in those markets, but then you also have these retail investors like hedge funds and pension funds, et cetera, buying these exchange traded fund products, trying to capitalize on rising food prices by, by buying in. And the evidence shows a massive inflow of cash, um, of investments into this sector. Uh, the, but there's also been dysfunction in the grain markets early on uh, in the crisis, where some grain elevators in the US actually refused to buy futures contracts from farmers because they didn't think that the prices on the futures markets actually reflected the real situation of supply and demand. So that dysfunction, again, it's a bit of a sign uh, that there's a problem in the markets. And also the share of speculators in the futures markets for wheat and maize has increased sharply since the end of 2020. So as prices were, all, were rising, speculators increasingly began to move into the market. They're at around 50% of the market now, 50, 60% are actually speculators uh, in these markets. And that suggests growing speculation. And speculation is what's driving the market now rather than playing the service of, of connecting buyers and sellers. They're actually driving the trends in the sector. 
So all of these are signs of excessive speculation that is distorting global grain markets. And this is important because these future markets determine the, the markets in the in the, the spot markets in the real world. Uh, so there may be trading these futures, which are sort of fictitious commodity type things, but it affects the real world and it drives up food prices and it affects the poorest people while enriching financial investors. Now, one factor that's important to note that may be encouraging this financial turmoil in the futures markets is that there's a lack of transparency uh, regarding global grain stocks. Uh, many of the grain trading companies, for example, the ABCD companies that I mentioned, they also hold significant stocks of grain. They're, in, you know, they're private companies and they have their own storage facilities. But these companies are not under any obligation to report their stocks publicly, uh, which leaves an information void that um, where speculators may panic um, and, and buy up uh, futures because they're not sure what the stocks are, and this can push up prices. So this has been happening even though we know that what is publicly reported, the stock to use ratio, that's the ratio of stocks to the ratio that is actually consumed in a year, is not that different from previous years. Uh, but this lack of transparency in the context of crisis has created a situation uh, where speculators have taken advantage of the situation. And as you can see on this slide, the price of wheat, which is in this sort of orangey yellow color, um, really shot up sharply after the conflict began. And then the line that's the sort of bluish color is, is the investment uh, flows that have come into uh, some of these key kinds of investment funds. These are the exchange traded funds that are trading in derivatives on, based on the price of wheat. So you can see this, this vicious cycle that occurs between um, rising food prices as well as the, the increased flows of investment in the sector. It's something that, uh, of course, it's a messy uh, relationship, but it's certainly related and we need to untangle it more. The fourth structural flaw outlined in the report is that simply the vicious cycle of conflict, climate change, poverty, and food insecurity. And we're basically in a situation where millions of people in low-income countries lack the income and the resources to adapt to shocks when they happen. And this is especially the case in the wake of the pandemic, when many governments had already have already exhausted their social protection uh, budgets. And in a, in, when food prices rise sharply, uh, this can be really problematic, especially when governments can't step in uh, and help people to access food. And these shocks that happen can come in many forms. Um, we know the, the conflict is one, but another is uh, climate-induced harvest failures uh, that are becoming more and more frequent, especially uh, in, in many countries in, in the Southern Hemisphere. And we also know that hunger is most acute in countries that are facing conflict. And there are many conflicts in the world. Around 60% uh, of the world's most acutely hungry people actually are in countries facing conflict. And this is triggering um, cycles of conflict, climate disruptions, and endemic poverty. And this is highly problematic because the poorest people in low-income countries spend over 60% of their income on food, uh, meaning that even small rises in food prices can lead to huge numbers of people not being able to access food and thus rising hunger and acute food insecurity. And that's the situation that we're in because the price rises have actually been quite dramatic. So it should, it should be clear, we're not just in one global food crisis at the moment, we're in the midst of multiple overlapping crises. Um, we have a situation where there's a global climate crisis that's lurking in the background, the pandemic induced crisis that uh, exhausted many countries' social protection spending and led to increased debt, uh, a conflict driven crisis in Ukraine that is also leading to a global food price crisis that was triggered by that event. So these overlapping crises really reinforce one another in pernicious ways. And so it's, it's, it's a very um, complex situation. So um, basically the policy responses to the crisis, we know they must work at two levels. They must address the immediate needs of those facing acute hunger right now and they must also correct for these structural flaws in food systems that I just outlined. And these same problems were present in the last crisis in 2008, 2009, uh, but in the intervening time, we didn't do a great job in fixing those problems. And so the question on many people's mind is, will it be different this time? And so this is 
where I want to offer a few things maybe we, we can discuss, because the, the context, I would argue, the policy context is changing, uh, and it may present some opportunities, but it also presents some challenges. So I know time is short, I'm just going to briefly go over these and then we can move to the discussion. Um, but one of the ways in which the context is changing is the ideological context. It's quite interesting to see now that the whole project of neoliberal globalization is increasingly contested. Uh, in, the, in the context of the last crisis, um, most states were still full in on neoliberal globalization, but what we're seeing today is more openness to self-reliance strategies, even in powerful states. And there's also more concern about monopoly power. Uh, for example, in the US and the EU, there's been quite a bit of policy movement to crack down on corporate concentration. But at the same time, um, the key agricultural exporting states continue to have interests in pushing specialization in trade in the agri-food sector. And so it's, it's not clear how this is going to shake out, but it's quite, it's quite interesting that uh, in the last crisis, if, you, uh, if a government said they wanted to move towards greater self-sufficiency, they were ridiculed in the Financial Times, uh, but we're not seeing that kind of response now. The ecological context is also different. Uh, those of us working on these issues know that the climate crisis is a reality, uh, but governments had treated it up until quite recently as more of a warning uh, than an actual reality. But we know from recent events in the past few years um, that the likelihood of drought and extreme events is much higher because they are already happening. The effects are tangible. And this is a context in which states may actually be taking it more seriously. Uh, but we don't know how um, it's going to play out um, if most states are still going to um, continue to leave the, it up to the market to address this or if they're going to take a more strict regulatory stance. Uh, the economic context is also different this time around. Um, this time around, we're seeing broad inflation across the entire economy. Last time, it was mostly uh, fuels and food. Uh, but this time, uh, it's, it's a much broader process. And we're also in a context of much higher interest rates and a greater risk of debt defaults uh, than was the case uh, before. Because last time, in the face of the financial crisis, there was a huge uh, reduction in interest rates and a lot of uh, loose monetary policy. But we're in a context of tightening right now and, and rising interest rates. And this could cause a much broader systemic risk uh, for the global economic system. So states are taking it seriously, but at the same time, their ability to act is quite constrained. And then finally, the geopolitical context is also very different. We're in, obviously this crisis was triggered by Russia invading Ukraine, uh, but we're in a context now where there's a growing alliance between Russia and China, and China is one of the largest lenders uh, to the countries in the global South uh, that are highly indebted right now. And, and we don't know if they default, what, what the impact is gonna be. Um, and also the situation makes multilateral responses very complex and challenging, uh, but it also may create openings for local, um, local kinds of initiatives. So that's just a few um, thoughts for, for uh, the discussion, but basically I think, you know, how these dynamics play out is really gonna matter enormously uh, for the future of food systems and food security. So given the time, I'm gonna end here and leave uh, discussion of the report's specific recommendations for the discussion period. Uh, but I wanna thank you for your attention and you can download the report on the IPES food website. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for this very um, comprehensive and also inform informative um, presentation. Uh, and to highlight it, basically the structural flaws and um, structural causes for, for, for the situation we're in right now, um, such as imports, dependencies, or um, entrenched production systems, and how not just one crisis, but how many different crises are currently overlapping. Um, I, would I would now like to integrate um, the three other distinguished guests into our conversation. And I would like to start, start with Michael Fakhri, the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food. Um, Michael, what is your analysis of the current food and agriculture crisis? Um, what are the worst likely outcomes and with what effect? And maybe lastly, what is really driving these impacts from, from your perspective? 
Thank you, Jan, and thank you everyone for, for being here. Um, and a big thank you to Jennifer. I just want to start with the, uh, just, um, just agreeing really with a lot of what she said, and I read that report with great interest, and I think just that was an incredible um, and nuanced analysis of what's going on. And what I appreciate is how Jennifer focused on how this isn't new. A lot of what's been happening are these are dynamics that have been going on for a while. So I think to understand what's going on, you know, we have to understand that hunger was on the rise starting in 2015, before the pandemic, before the Ukrainian crisis. Um, as Jennifer pointed, a lot of structural issues of the 2007-2008 food crisis have not been addressed in terms of um, market volatility, uh, limiting uh, uh, speculation. This is the same, we're dealing with a lot of the same problems. The World Trade Organization has been problematic since its inception in 1994. From the beginning, people from the food sovereignty movement, from labor organization, from environmental organizations, pointed out a lot of the limitations of the WTO. And we're now seeing these still play out today. And in fact, today, I think is the last day of uh, ministerial negotiations that are going on in Geneva, um, uh, as we or they're probably done because Geneva's ahead. Um, and I'll go back a little bit more just to add context and then I'll, I'll, I'll be more specific. So the Green Revolution of the 1960s and 1970s also coincides with the rise of corporate power, globally speaking. Corporations didn't always dominate our food system. They really start taking over on a global scale in the 1970s. But we can go back to as far as the Industrial Revolution and the commodification of land and food and the expansion of, of empires. So really what's at heart, what's at stake here is for too long, everything, so one way to summarize a lot of this, uh, what Jennifer was saying is all of these systems, markets, policies, all of it, they keep treating food and all the things we need to make food like something that can be bought and sold easily, whether it's people's labor, whether it's land, whether it's water. And, and so these crises, they keep erupting. They're always predictable. They're always avoidable. So this particular crisis is, is in that long stream of things. So the question I'm asking myself was why now? Why has there been this huge global response now when since the pandemic started, many of us have been saying we must do something. This isn't the first time Russia has invaded Ukraine. This isn't the first time Russia has attacked another country like Georgia. This isn't the first time Russia has killed civilians like in Syria. Why now? So that I'll maybe, so some things I'm sort of thinking through is one, so what does this reveal to us? One, it tells us that um, uh, racism is alive today. There's that element. The way the, 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 the war in Ukraine, the invasion of Ukraine has been framed by many people is as a fight for the heart of Europe, ignoring the conflicts and, the, and the, the lives that have been, people that have been suffering for years, if not decades, treating that as, oh, conflict is something that happens over there, not over here in Europe. So racism is a structural dynamic at play. Um, second, I think the trade regime has finally hit, hit that brick wall. It's, it, it's, it's done. I mean, people within the WTO say the agreement on agriculture is outdated. TRIPS, which deals with intellectual property, is why we can't get vaccines out there fast enough. So we, people are debating food security in the WTO in ways we've never seen before. It's because the trade regime has finally hit a dead end, I think. But what will happen next is, is quite open. Um, and then third, I think what's at stake also is not just the trade regime, all international institutions, I think, are to blame of, of getting us to where we are today, and all governments, very few, maybe one or two, maximum three or four governments, I think, have responded to the pandemic properly, to the food crisis properly. So I think we're in a legitimacy crisis. Governments are realizing that they are losing control over their own territory, over their people, over their borders, over themselves. So uh, I think, and so the, my concern is hunger is going to get, it's going to get worse before, uh, um, and that we're going to see more violence from state-based institutions as, as governments panic and try and retain control. Um, and just the last point on how to think about prices. Again, I, 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 um, I really uh, agree with a lot of what Jennifer said. What prices often reflect, the way I think about prices, is not um, supply and demand, um, it can to some degree, but prices often reflect power dynamics. Prices reflect the bargaining power in a system. Who has the most bargaining power? And so what we're seeing is price volatility, which has been a problem in agricultural markets since at least the 19th century. This is a long-standing problem. 
But today's price volatility reflects what Jennifer was saying, is the fact that speculators have the most power. People that are buying and selling, not even um, uh, real things, but derivative products, invented financial instruments, have the most power, whereas the people who have the least power are people that are hungry, that need food, uh, um, communities, and the price volatility and the price spikes reflect the power dynamics in markets. Um, so I'll, I'll end there. Thank you so much, Michael, for um, in, like integrating now your thoughts um, and your analysis in, in, into our debate today, um, especially bringing also up the question of uh, power dynamics into markets. It's, it's really crucial, I believe. Uh, I would like to continue now with um, Nada. Um, Nada, countries in North Africa and in West Asia um, heavily depend on food inputs from either Russia or um, Ukraine. Um, and what is happening in North Africa and, and maybe in Tunisia um, in particular right now due to the war in Ukraine and um, interrupted supply chains? Um, how, much, how much more maybe are people spending on stable foods? Uh, what do these rising prices mean for the lives of ordinary people? And then lastly, in your opinion, what are the main factors causing food insecurity in, in, in North Africa uh, today? Quite a few big questions, but I'm sure you can manage. The floor is yours. Nada, you're still um, muted. Could you please um, unmute yourself, sorry. Thank you very much for uh, for the very insightful information. In fact, I have to Merci beaucoup pour cette magnifique Thank you very much for this very interesting uh, presentation. En effet, je ne peux qu'être d'accord sur I am, uh, beaucoup de points spécifiquement I agree pour, with uh, many of the points that have been made so far, particularly uh, pour les quatre questions qui ont été posées, notamment la, asked, la dépendance et the, la question de la, de la the question des systèmes de production of ainsi que of la production system then the speculation and the, and the climate change. And I'm going to concentrate on the first two and the last point on the region. Uh, en effet, uh, well, la, 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 nos, nos pays dans la région sont très dépendants à l'importation par There are many countries that depend uh, on imports cons consume, uh, because they consume So the, these uh, countries depend on the imports of the cereals. In Tunisia, we have uh, the importation of the last three years that is 30 to 40 percent. And I think if for Egypt, it is 80 percent. So you see very clearly by these two examples that our region is uh, very much uh, impacted by the effects of climate change. There is a real problem of access, particularly what uh, the resource, the water, uh, water is concerned. There are, uh, the, this is due to climate change, but also what you've uh, labeled as the fact that the production systems don't correspond to the needs of uh, consumption, which means that this problem of dependency is uh, strengthened. In uh, Tunisia and in the region, what has been encouraged is is to have uh, fruit for exportation. That means uh, the philosophy of agriculture is not a means to have food for people living in the region, but it's more a means to uh, stabilize the macroeconomic indicators and to see that there is a payment of a debt 
which is becoming more and more important. And uh, so we are changing into a situation where we have an, a very high volume of debt. And on the question of how the people live in uh, this situation, in this uh, uh, situation of crisis. In our countries, we have we have uh, social safety nets, but this, these are subsidies, and uh, this creates some kind of uh, protection for our citizens when it comes to price increases. So we don't have the problem of of uh, very high prices on the local markets, but we've had a problem in Tunisia of availability, particularly uh, flour based on wheat. And uh, in the wake of the Russian invasion to the Ukraine, but the, 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 there is an old problem. This is the economic dependency of Tunisia. We've had a problem that uh, they have been um, there have been imports that have uh, been blocked in ports because uh, they couldn't be paid and it uh, took a while to to deal with this and this is a general problem on what has been happening in uh, tunisia we have an inflation rate that is really increasing and we know that uh, that people in Tunisia spend 30 to 40 percent of their household revenues on food. And uh, there, there is, of course, the pressure of uh, the debts, and, and that means that uh, there will be more subsidies on primary foods like wheat, and uh, there will be more pressure on citizens. This is in general what is happening. Thank you so much, um, Nada, for sharing um, some insights from North Africa and North African countries. And that's also very helpful for, for debate and also to mention a few um, further um, structural courses for, for, for difficult situations. Uh, before we before we continue with Maya, um, Jennifer, since we're already talking a little bit about also policy responses and the policy environment, so to say, um, uh, powerful actors such as big companies and some political decision makers, they propose um, now as, 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 an, as an response or as an answer to the current crisis to suspend um, environmental regulation. For instance, um, the European Union, uh, farm to fork um, strategy and making demands for more investments into industrialized <clears throat> um, agriculture and um, yeah and actually basically the efforts for the protection of of, of global supply chains um what is what is your opinion on on the, on these um, um policy recommendations is this from your perspective uh, the right way to tackle the 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 the, the, the crisis you just described um, or are these suggestions rather quote unquote um, fault solutions? Uh, thank you, Jan. Yeah, I would I would put those recommendations in the the fault solutions category, uh, as you said. Um, this, as I mentioned, we're not in a crisis of production right now, and in fact, um, the capacity to in like to shift current production is um, quite big uh, because so much of the production right now of, of food crops uh, goes to, to livestock feed and to biofuels. Uh, but this argument of relaxing environmental regulations in particular in order to intensify production, that's an argument that's been brought out by agribusiness since at least the 1970s. Um, and it's very much a kind of a productionist response that really only conceptualizes food security in terms of the amount of food uh, 
uh, that's being produced. And it ignores other dimensions of food security, in particular access, as uh, Nada just made very clear, is extremely important. And that's whether people can access, you know, acquire food. And it also ignores the sustainability dimension of food security, which you know, is, is important for the long-term uh, regenerative capacity of food systems. Um, and, and we know that most food crises happen in contexts, as I said, where there is enough food available. And that is the case right now. It's just not very accessible because prices have gone up uh, across a number of countries. In fact, most countries we're seeing food price inflation, but in some countries it's especially uh, stark, places like Yemen and Egypt, uh, Ethiopia, Somalia, places, Tunisia, places that rely on imported grains. So, and, and also we have to remember that intensifying that uh, grain production really exacerbates problems of, of environmental implications of agriculture, especially when they are geared towards those kinds of industrial um, high chemical use methods. That was what the business lobby in the EU wanted, a relaxation of pesticide regulations so that they could spray uh, more chemicals in industrial uh, production methods, and also to, to grow on um, marg sensitive lands that might be uh, marginally productive, and but growing on them would cause a huge uh, environmental implications, um, you know, greenhouse gases, pollution of soils and waters, uh, harm to biodiversity, et cetera. So th this kind of solution isn't really the one I would argue that we need. It's more of a false solution. Um, and the, the better way to address these problems is to provide assistance to those people who are finding it difficult to access food and to stay the course uh, with, with policies that are designed to protect the environment uh, in the agriculture sector. So I'll, I'll leave it there, but, but thank you for the question. Thank you so much, Jennifer, and uh, sorry, Maya, for uh, making you wait for such a long time. Um, it's it's very obvious that uh, we need to make food and agricultural systems much more resilient. Um, and for a very long time, one could find Brazil um, on the world hunger map, and then maybe all of a sudden, uh, it disappeared from this from this map. And one of the reasons why Brazil was so successful in combating hunger was the food acquisition program that was implemented under the then President Lula. Can you describe for us what is this, what is the food acquisition program and maybe also how did it work and in, in, in what ways did it contribute to the alleviation of um, hunger um, and also at the same time improved uh, nutrition in such a, um, a big country um, as, as Brazil? Thank you, Jan. Um, uh, thank you, and first of all, thank you for the opportunity to be in this uh, very relevant and high quality panel. And thank you for the action and policy response oriented question. Uh, second, in responding to your question, uh, well, it wasn't much all of a sudden that Brazil was removed from the hunger map. Uh, it took more than 10 years of continuous implementation and improvement of public policies centered in improving populations, food security and nutrition in Brazil. And this involves uh, many initiatives from uh, many ministry, ministries in a coordinated fashion, uh, uh, comprising like this, at least four uh, um, axes, let's say. One, of course, provide access to food uh, to the most vulnerable people, more or less what uh, Jennifer is saying, you know, by conditional tra uh, cash transfer, school feeding program, and local policies as well, because it needs to involve all levels uh, from municipality to uh, state to, to national levels, like uh, even community restaurants, food banks, you know, that there's a comment about food loss and waste that can help reducing uh, food waste and, uh, and, and give this access uh, uh, to vulnerable farmers. Second, strengthening of family farming, which is a key, uh, you know, uh, two thirds of the uh, extreme poverty is uh, concentrated in rural areas, and mostly those are smallholder farmers. This includes credit, essential services, access to markets, and this is related to food acquisition program that I will uh, work a bit more later. Income generation from microcredit and, and employment generation, territorial development. Fourth, the uh, social control, no? the, the enforcement that food is a human rights. And, and promoting uh, mobilization, participation in, in many governance mechanisms. 
So the issue is what can be done in a situation like we, we are living? And yes, food acquisition program is an important uh, response, response. And uh, it works to provide a regular market uh, to smallholder and poor farmers, to what we call institutional procurement market on the one hand, and on the other hand, distributing this, uh, this food that is acquired by those smallholder farmers to poor and vulnerable populations as part of social assistance and other food-related programs as food feeding programs. No? Uh, so it's important to acknowledge that the food procurement is a sizable market. Uh, in Brazil, uh, let's say uh, the direct food, uh, food procurement from smallholder in, in this, this, let's say, peak was uh, 1 billion reais at that time, but the, the, the other markets from agricultural products or for food procurement reached 5 billion. Uh, and other kinds of food procurement from private sector, from food industry, uh, can be, was estimated about 12 uh, billion. In Europe, we also estimate 82 billion euros uh, for social food service markets, for example. What you need to do is to make them accessible for the poorest families, farmers, farmers, removing the barriers for them to access this existing market, which in general is concentrating on the big traders. Uh, uh, if you don't make any uh, regulation, uh, the, the big traders are the ones that are um, supplying those uh, public uh, procurement markets. And, and what we did in Brazil was uh, adopt a limit, a cap for each other, which is small, but it can avoid concentration and uh, benefit lo uh, uh, more farmers using the family farmer registry in order to ident identify the poorest uh, register also the associations related to their farmers because when you uh, let's say gather no when you 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 uh, consider buying from cooperatives or associations uh, it can facilitate uh, the uh, transaction costs establish a local market pricing and mechanism to collect pay and distribute the product this is what uh, we did no uh, in terms of uh, the, the, the benefits for food security and nutrition, as you asked, I will uh, very quickly share two slides. It's not a, a big, big deal, just to facilitate my, my explanation. I hope you can see. Uh, and this is a result of many um, uh, how can say, studies that were done. The, the uh, food acquisition program in Brazil is one of the most studied program in terms of its impact in many aspects, in nutrition and, and food security, and also local development, road development. So one is this, no? uh, the impact, the access to markets as a source of income can increase how households, uh, farmers' expenditures on food, also increase on farm food production and reduce risks uh, uh, of adoption of negative uh, coping mechanisms, sorry. Um, and on the other hand, uh, in terms of nutrition, it is uh, uh, it can result in a, a demand that is more diversified because at household level you also encourage diversification uh, that we were talking about. <laughs> Jennifer is talking uh, through food procurement. You can increase the diversification because you increase the list of products that you can demand for farmers. And uh, you can also, on the other hand, uh, increase the diversification of, of this food basket in the food assistance programs and provide this a, a more, a, a, and it, they can have access to more diversified uh, mechanisms in markets. Uh, so yeah, so regarding those studies, no, uh, it, it is still essential. It was an important way to mitigate the effects of the pandemic of the population in social risk in Brazil. Unfortunately, the, the, the public budget is decreasing a lot since it is peak in 2014, uh, uh, which is coincidentally the period where, where we saw uh, food insecurity increasing uh, here uh, in the region and also in, in the country. But yes, uh, it promotes uh, better access to 
more importantly, fresh and minimally, minimally processed food, because we are talking about fresh food, locally grown uh, fresh food that can be distributed to uh, vulnerable farmers at local level, decreasing also uh, the footprint and promoting a better eating habits. Just, just to uh, finalize my response. Thank you, Jan. Thank you so much, um, Maya. Um, also for helping us to find this, let's say, solution-oriented um, um, path um, that uh, make that makes it very clear that um, policy uh, interventions, um, depending on how they are implemented, can really make a difference and help to improve um, 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 the food and agriculture situation in this in, in this case in in Brazil. Um, let's maybe continue to talk <clears throat> more about concrete policy prescriptions now in our second round. Um, what is needed to relieve this food price crisis now and also what can be done to create more resilient food and agricultural systems in the long term? Um, I also realized that uh, time is flying, so it would be wonderful if uh, from now almost every speaker could restrict um, himself or herself to maybe two minutes per, per question so that we have also have another 20 minutes or so for interaction uh, um, 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 with, with the audience. Um, I would like to start with you, um, Nada. Um, you already mentioned a few uh, interventions by, uh, by, by the state in, in order to sort of cushion um, the, the, the current uh, situation. Um, and yeah, so from your perspective, what kind of support do people need now to survive um, from the national government and from maybe also from the international community? And lastly, uh, you're also a member of the North African Food Sovereignty Network. And what are maybe the two or three most important uh, demands now um, from, from, from this um, uh, network? And as I said, it would be great uh, to not to take longer than two minutes. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jan. Well, we started talking about uh, consumption and about the, the, the access of uh, the poorest to nutrition, but we didn't talk about uh, other factors, about the, the farmers. They also have not enough access to alimentation because of uh, specialization. And uh, I would like to mention uh, uh, policy measures that uh, Tunisia has taken is to uh, to look at uh, the uh, of the buying of cereals by farmers. Uh, this so that the uh, agricultures are uh, encouraged to do this. The agri the farmers uh, themselves. Uh, are drivers of change, they can lead to more resilience uh, or to more dependence. The international markets and the, the price increases and also the fact that, that uh, the farmers uh, go into this uh, policy of uh, having higher prices, but this cannot compensate, for example, uh, the increases of, of uh, oil prices, uh, and this is uh, very important. And also that the uh, farmers themselves uh, are outside of uh, any thinking about uh, looking into the uh, nutrition system, and they are the, the main actors in this field, that means for the uh, North African network, it is very important to have this uh, vision of, of food sovereignty. This is a basic concept for a new agricultural policy that puts into the center again uh, agriculture as the primary function of producing food for uh, people in the region and not uh, not an element for stabilizing the economy even if the situation now is uh, very much uh, one of pressure 
because we have a macroonic uh, disbalance and that means we have even more pressure and we have uh, debts and we have uh, conditions to have more subsidies on food and and on hydrocarbons and that means higher prices and that means there is uh, less access to people to nutrition so we have to look into uh, the, the dependency on other production to the seeds technology pesticides and fertilizers and uh, we also have to take into consideration the uh, effects on uh, climate change and also desertification. We lose uh, a lot of land that could be cultivated and uh, could give a minimum of uh, food security. But if you look into the policies of intensification and that if we are not looking to have a more resilient agriculture, a more sustainable agriculture, this will continue. We will have less access to uh, water as a resource, uh, to seeds. Uh, research on seeds should be very clear. We need to have uh, local varieties that need to be stabilized. They can resist to the uh, conditions of a change in climate. So all this could be summarized into to to adopt uh, to have uh, food sovereignty to have um, more more power of the farmers and take them into consideration and take into consideration the the local production conditions and it's also necessary to see that we have a local situation, for example, as far as bread is concerned, we import 90% of, it, of, uh, of wheat. This is not something that we are produ producing. This is something that we consume. And I come back to uh, uh, what uh, Jennifer has uh, talked about, the erosion of uh, nutrition systems. And I think I uh, have taken my time. I will change here. Thank you so much, Nala. It was a bit longer than two minutes. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, uh, <laughs> we continue now with, uh, uh, with um, Maya. Um, it was already mentioned more than once that it seems to be important to increase food reserves and also to reduce the dependency on food inputs. And can you explain a little bit how the, the programs in Brazil, how they impacted producers? Did, it, did the programs lead to more sustainable practices? Practices Did it help Brazil to increase food reserves or diversify production um, or to produce sustainable and more nutritious um, food um you have uh, two two minutes um the the clock starts tick uh, now um and the floor is yours thank you thank you jan yeah i will i will charge a little bit yes it had uh, i mentioned that uh, the program had uh, impacted positively food security and nutrition but uh, on the other hand, uh, as I said, increased income of family farmers and influencing expansion of consumer of consumption of, of them. The promotion of sustainability, as I said, according to analysis and studies that uh, there are many, and some of them also gather the many and uh, considering different uh, criteria, uh, it occurs by for example, encouraging agroecological production and or organic through uh, the differentiated prices. Uh, so giving a bit of a, a better price to agroecological pro, pro, uh, products or organic, let, let's say, uh, uh, you, can, you can stimulate more this kind sort of production than the others and can stimulate the diversification of, of production. Also, uh, at that time, we had a kind of um, a specific uh, uh, procurement for products of sustainability, let's say, that has a kind of, as, uh, kind of stamp uh, that are specific 
very local and uh, uh, related to uh, specific agroecological conditions that you can also buy and, and promote its consumption. And it can also uh, be those that have specific uh, timeline in the year that can be harvested. So you can really facilitate the, the diversification of, of, of uh, the production. Uh, and it, this can also open other markets for the same products, we call products of social diverse, biodiversity, that has a, a social dimension of social groups of, let's say, women, farmers, cooperatives, or indigenous peoples with uh, specific products of the, that uh, area. Uh, that has a sustainability label, let's say, sustainability uh, criteria. Uh, other than that, yeah, just uh, to inform that you can also make food reserve with public procurement. And this was one of the, let's say, modalities of the program. It wasn't operated so much at that time. Uh, you need to have a public company, of course, to operate those, those reserves. But even to do that, you need to buy food. You can buy food from, the, from smaller farmers and from associations and cooperatives, and it can help in preventing the fluctuation of, of prices. You know, what, uh, one of the proposed policy options that Jennifer presented is that, yes, we need to increase uh, those food reserves at a minimum level to avoid those price fluctuation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maya. That was only two and a half minutes. I'm very happy. I'm um, sorry so much for rushing through, but I would really like to get at least one round of questions from the um, audience. Um, Jennifer, um, uh, earlier we discussed uh, the fault solutions, um, but then uh, what are the real solutions from your perspective? Um, what are maybe the yeah? What are the most important political interventions to make food systems more resilient in the longer term? And how can we get there? Uh, what are the steps? Um, and what are also the steps we need to implement right now? Thank you, Jan. Um, yeah. Well, as I mentioned in my presentation, the responses do need to operate at those two levels of the immediate and the longer term. Uh, and I'll, I'll try to be really brief because the report goes through lots of, of recommendations and I'll just hit some of the highlights. But in terms of what can be done right now, we've already emphasized the need for financial assistance uh, to help those individuals who can't access food as well as countries who can't import food. Um, that's essential. And debt relief is a big um, contributor to that kind of assistance because providing, you know, relieving debts and providing debt relief can really uh, provide the policy space for uh, governments to, to be able to import food or and, un, and also to invest in more sustainable food systems domestically. Um, also more immediate things that can happen, we can consider, a, you know, governments can consider a temporary moratorium on biofuels, which take a, a, a pretty significant chunk uh, of production capacity. Um, and also we need to begin the crackdown on commodity speculation and increase transparency in commodity markets that are big contributors to price volatility. Um, so for example, we can, you know, rules can be passed to require the ABCD companies to um, disclose um, their stocks, for example. Um, and and the, the road to regulation, of course, of commodity markets, the last crisis saw a huge effort and it didn't result in, in regulations that were any better than they had been. But that discussion needs to begin to happen again, and it needs to begin now. Um, in terms of the longer run, my comments, uh, the recommendations of the IPES report really resonate well with um, some of the other comments made, especially from uh, Maya. Um, the, the main thing in the longer term is we need to expand the range of countries and regions that are producing staple foods, not just for trade, but also for their own consumption, uh, because we need to reduce that concentrated uh, production and export markets that are um, causing that rigidity in global food systems. Uh, and it would reduce, help to reduce those import dependencies that um, Nada spoke to. Um, and we also need a wider variety of foods being produced. Uh, and this includes, again, as Maya was saying, more traditional and ecologically appropriate crops. Uh, so for example, millets or, or cassava that don't require the same level of uh, industrial and, and agrochemical kind of inputs. And that greater diversity is also good for improving the diversity of diets and nutrition. And, and that was also mentioned. I was really glad to see Maya's presentation on the reports or the, the studies that show 
um, how more uh, local and regional production can really improve incomes and uh, improve diets. And, and we need more sustainable production practices such as agroecology. I saw in the, in the chat going on, you know, some questions about fertilizer use and et cetera. And it's obviously a transition to a more agroecological model is gonna take some time and it, it, it can't necessarily happen overnight. We, we know that there can be uh, problems when that happens, but this, the, the world was producing excessive surpluses even before um, this rapid rise in uh, the use of fertilizers and, and chemicals um, had begun. And so we need to wean the world off of those kind of addictions to those, to those agrochemicals. And we need more of those local and regional markets to reduce the reliance on the global value chain. So in short, diversity in the long run is extremely important. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for um, these um, recommendations. Um, Michael, um, over to you. Um, what are the three most important uh, political initiatives that need to happen now, like now, now to tackle and to avoid the next hunger crisis? Um, even if we're already, win in a, already in a hunger crisis, actually. And what are the three most important interventions that, that need to happen in the short um, term to relieve a growing hunger? Um, so um, given that you have two minutes, so that's uh, one minute each per question. Great, thank you. So I'll echo a lot of what's been said. So first, in terms of immediate uh, things that can be done, cash transfer. Uh, that has been proving in the in the pandemic. That's what we learned is the most effective. Give people money. Um, uh, there's arguments for social protection, which are good, or providing direct relief with food that also can work. But cash transfer, if immediate and effective. The second thing to keep in mind is if the people who feed us go hungry, we go hungry. That means workers and farmers, primarily speaking. So enforce labor laws. There's a lot of good labor laws on, on the books in many countries, and there's a lack of enforcement and, and ensure that people's right to, uh, to join a union is, is maintained. Um, that's on the worker side and enhance farmer bargaining power as well. So encouraging farmers to negotiate prices collectively through cooperatives or through other mechanisms. Um, so making sure that the people that feed us are protected, I think is in the immediate term. And then um, for political initiatives, you know, what's interesting to me is, you know, as Special Rapporteur on the right to food, of course, I'm going to focus on the right to food, but it, separate from my own role, every crisis we've seen in the last 60 years, you see the right to food being redefined and reemerged and being used and dynamic and political and all that, except this food crisis. It's very interesting to see governments are not really committing to the right to food. What's powerful about the right to food is it's been defined by people, by people's movements, and it continues to be redefined by people's movements in their everyday practices, by indigenous peoples, by peasant farmers, by fisher folk, pastoralists, trade unions, activists, and it's no different today. So I'm going to be speaking to the General Assembly in October. They asked me to focus on COVID on the food crisis. I'm writing my report, and my, one of my requests is that governments reaffirm their commitment to the right to food as it's being defined in today's terms, one. Two, that we discuss trade and the right to food outside of the WTO. There are other forums where we can discuss it. The, the UN Conference on Trade and Development, UNCTAD, has now um, uh, reached out to the Office of the High Commission of Human Rights to think about trade and the right to food. That's one way we could do it. There's the Committee on World Food Security. There are so many spaces. And I think part of the way we need to reframe um, trade is not just trade for the sake of trade, but it could be about managing national stocks and private stocks, um, price stability, um, and focusing on, on trade is, is, is some countries, I'm from Lebanon, we're, we're going to have to trade no matter what, but it has to be trade based on people's notion of dignity and solidarity. And then finally, this is just to echo what everyone's been saying in different ways, is a commitment to shifting to more sustainable methods, let's say agroecology, but I would add that it be a just transition. It is difficult to transition from one system to another. Um, and you can transition in a lot of bad ways. And I have lots of bad examples one can do, but that transition needs to be just. And what I mean very specifically by that is it needs to be a negotiation between workers and farmers. We saw in India when workers and trade unions and farmers found that new alliance of 
negotiating and finding that space of solidarity, it's a force that you, is, is profound and progressive. So I think to think about a just transition to agroecology as this negotiation between um, workers and, and smallholder farmers or peasants. I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Michael. Uh, and thank you so much um, to everyone present in this uh, in this online event. Um, there is there was a lot of traffic also in the Q and A and in the chat, and to uh, do this engagement at least a little bit of justice, um, I would like to ask one or two questions per 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 speaker before, unfortunately, we have to come to an end. And um, uh, so, the, Nada, the question for you um, is a development of local markets is great for smallholders and local communities. Uh, more than 50% of the global population now live in cities. And how should these mega cities be supplied in, 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 in uh, low and middle income countries as well as, as well as in the developed world? So that will be the question for you, Nada. I hope that you, um, uh, that you can memorize it. Um, and then Michael, um, to you, maybe one and a half or two questions. One is, um, that you might be aware of the uh, recent call by La Via Campesina uh, for countries to leave um, the WTO. <laughs> you also mentioned in the in the very beginning of your presentation um, or the first round of questions that um, trade and WTO is, is, is a big problem. So that is um, one question for you. And the second one is how to break the dominance of the ABCDs and trade other than, than just increasing um, local production. These are the questions for you. Um, Jennifer, um, uh, kind of, yeah, quite complex question um, that goes to you. Um, how can we both address the expected production declines from decreased synthetic fertilizer use in the short run and also encourage long-term shifts away from um, such inputs, which decrease resilience? And that is the question that goes to you. Um, and uh, last but not um, least, Maya, uh, you mentioned food as a human right, and what, uh, what role, if any, did the human rights treaties that Brazil signed so far um, play into achieving better food security uh, for people in the country? Uh, in particular, the International Convenient on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. Um, Maya, do you want to start? And then we continue with Nada, and then Michael, and then um, as a final speaker, Jennifer. Thank you. Thank you for the question, Jan. Yes, I mentioned this was a basis for the Zero Hunger Program that started in 2003 um, in Brazil, and uh, uh, that was built under what we call a very participatory manner uh, that from the bottom, let's say, promoted the, the creation of local councils for our committee to promote local policies for uh, food security and nutrition with the human rights land, lands and at, at state level and at national level. The National uh, Food Security and Nutrition Council uh, with, uh, let's say, uh, two thirds of civil society organizations participate and the one third of government from different ministries and uh, a lot of social mobilization as well, because it's a long story, a bit what, what uh, uh, Jan mentioned, no? that uh, it needs to be come from bottom. And uh, from that long spot, uh, uh, mobilization process, uh, we could uh, approve the right to food in the constitution. And this is the, in, in the constitution of Brazil in 2019. And this is the one of the key ways to guarantee the, the right to food. Let's say that the food, when you are born, you have, you are entitled to it. You don't need to ask, you don't need to pay uh, any favor or political favor to have access to food assistance, for example, because it's a right. And if you don't receive, uh, you, you, you can, let's say, sue the, the government. The issue is, and, and a lot of uh, conversation and dialogue also with the judicial system to, to make it uh, being guaranteed. Of course, in the, now we see that being the constitution not necessarily guaranteed. And, uh, but uh, as, as John said, I think we need to keep the, the, the social uh, mobilization 
because without it, uh, even uh, the governments can remove, can, can change laws, can change constitution. Uh, and uh, the, the only way is to, to denounce, let's say, to make public what uh, the consequences of not having those, uh, those rights guaranteed uh, and make it uh, reinforced, you know? That, that's, that's from my point of view. Thank you, Jan. Thank you so much, um, Maya. Let's continue with another. Another the question was on development of local markets and how to supply uh, people living in the cities. Yes. Um, donc, uh, the idea va, um, va is how are we going to think about how to give supply to the to the cities and is this a question that can be seen without without the cities and they set up themselves it's something that cannot be distinguished so we you have to think about urbanization and urban planning at the moment this is happening. There is uh, arable land that is being taken because of uh, uh, city development uh, uh, discussions at the moment, and uh, this, these are discussions, very important discussions, because uh, you can have uh, nutrition for the city on these lands. We have very little looked into the supply of the community in nutrition. We have to think about this very good solution to have uh, to place agriculture into the center of these thoughts and about on the local needs. And I would like to come back to the question uh, or the, the answer Maya has given. The idea to have a, a right on to nutrition, even if uh, in our country this is not discussed to be part of the constitution, this is something that could give a very strong message. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Nada. There were two questions directed to you, Michael. Uh, one was concerning um, the recent um, demand by La Via Campesina for countries to leave the WTO. Uh, and the second one was um, how to break the dominance and power of the ABCDs in trade, <clears throat> other than just, just increasing local production. Thank you. And I'll just, I want to build on what something Maya and Nada said about the right to food. Something to keep in mind is, is people don't have to wait for the right to food to be in their constitution. So sometimes it's in the constitution, but because it's a human right, you can demand it. Uh, and, and all levels of government can enact it and all public in, uh, institutions can take on the right to food as their agenda. This is the power of human rights and specifically the right to food is so dynamic. So don't wait, it's yours to, to, to enact really is, is that. Second on the Via Campesina's call to, for, for, to, to leave the WTO, I think this is a reasonable demand. I think the WTO has failed on many fronts. The people who are critical of the WTO policies but are reluctant to, to call for the end of the WTO defend the institution because they say, well, at least the WTO is multilateral um, and it is rule-based. My worry is it is multilateral and rule-based and predictable in terms that are not serving people. So, so what if it's multilateral and rule-based and predictable, if it's causing harm? And so one has to resist it, but also build something anew at the same time. Because what I've seen in many revolutions is if you get rid of the existing power, but you don't fill it in with something else, sometimes what follows is worse, right? I'll speak about Lebanon. I won't speak about Egypt, for example. Um, and as, as, as how revolutions work. So one must resist and build at the same time. And this is why I, I suggest we talk about trade and the right to food in other forums and start building more quickly. And then how to break up the ABCDs in um, one, there's multiple mechanisms to limit corporate power. Uh, corporate law itself 
corporations are legal fictions. We invent them. So we get to decide their power. So using corp the power of what creates a corporation, uh, and, um, uh, competition law, or what the Americans would call antitrust law, which limits market concentration, and other mechanisms of accountability, namely through human rights. Um, and, and right now there's an international treaty being negotiated on being able to hold uh, companies more accountable. But also in that spirit of resist and build, one has to also enhance and keep promoting other ways we socially organize ourselves. Corporations are one way we organize ourselves and organize resources, but there are many other ways we've heard some today, whether there are cooperatives, whether they are other social types of organizations, whether they're public procurement programs, there's so many ways we already organize ourselves and we can focus on enhancing and supporting those and trying, we don't need corporations to feed ourselves, so remove them from the picture. Thank you so much, um, Michael, for this very inspiring um, speech. Uh, Jennifer, um, over to you, uh, the question concerning uh, the, the fertilizers. Uh, and maybe, um, I believe it's really important that uh, some people mentioned the role of the CFS or the Committee on World Food Security. And we all know that it's highly under attack. So maybe you could elaborate in 30 seconds or so, uh, what, uh, what, what about the CFS now and what, what role the CFS could play? Thank you, Jan. I, I recognize the time is uh, sh very short, um, so I'll be I'll be quick. Um, I the the question on um, how do we address production declines if we drop fertilizer use quickly and also encourage long term resilience? I think it's an important question, but I think what we need to understand the 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 part of the uh, report where we focus on one of the structural flaws being the lock ins of the industrial production systems. It's not just that you keep all that system and then you just take out the fertilizer. Of course, that kind of system is gonna have some problems and production declines. What needs to happen is a lot of things need to shift at the same time to move away from those kinds of, of models. So just to give an example, um, modern seeds are actually bred specifically to be more responsive to fertilizers. And so if you're gonna plant modern seeds, you're gonna to have to use a lot of fertilizers, especially if you're using you know, hybrid and genetically modified maize. And so the key is to shift systems by using different, by planting, first of all, crops that aren't so thirsty for fertilizers, um, and also crops that aren't so thirsty for herbicides and other kinds of agrochemicals. These chemicals have really shot up in recent decades quite remarkably. And so shifting the seeds within the system, shifting the, the types of crops that are grown, this can help in terms of the transition to ensure there's not a huge um, production decline, um, because that is inevitable with the green revolution. You take out any one element and the system doesn't work. So you need to change the system. So, you know, we could talk about that all day. I'll stop there. Um, it's just that production lock-ins, we need to move away from, from those systems. Um, regarding the CFS, I, I was really, um, interested to hear Michael's comments about the need to discuss trade, for example, in other forums like the CFS uh, or UNCTAD or, or other places outside of the WTO. And I think this is the moment um, where that can happen. I think um, the CFS right now, I think, is quite receptive to talking about some of these uh, bigger structural issues um, because it is interested in playing a, a stronger role in addressing the crisis. And this is where um, these problems lie in the WTO, as Michael mentioned, it, it is quite weak. Um, this, I think, um, obviously the CFS is a multilateral institution, but it, so it also faces some of the problems that the WTO faces or, or other contexts that are multilateral where we've got new geopolitical dynamics and um, they affect the ability uh, of a global consensus. And so I think the CFS is yeah, in my read, it's in a bit of a challenging situation, but it is also a potentially an opportunity um, to, to jump into this space and um, to do more, to do more on uh, the pandemic, as Michael mentioned, uh, and to do more on um, this current crisis. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for um, your remarks. Um, the time is up. Um, unfortunately, we uh, we did not manage to um, solve the entire crisis. Uh, nevertheless, um, I really hope that um, maybe our discussion today helped to, let's say, spark one or two um, creative thoughts uh, we can take um, with us and um, and and uh, creative thoughts and maybe some very practical recommendations how um, to tackle the current crisis 
uh, in the in the short term, but also um, what is quite obvious also in, in, in the long and medium term in order to change uh, food systems and to make them much more um, resilient. Uh, first of all, I would really like to thank all our panelists. Thank you so much, Jennifer, Michael, Nada and Maya. It was really a great pleasure to um, have you with us today. Um, of course, I also thank uh, thank the the audience for your like really uh, engaged um, discussions uh, in, in in the Q and A and also in um, in the chat. Um, and I also would like to thank you, the team working in the background, and I would also like to thank you, our interpreters. Um, you did really a great and amazing job. Um, I hope that uh, we will see each other uh, soon um, again and uh, maybe next time uh, in order to solve such um, or to discuss such a big issue, maybe we should, um, instead of just organizing one online event, we should uh, focus on, on, on organizing um, an online series, but this is then for the future. Once again, thank you so much and uh, depending where you are, I wish you a wonderful morning, afternoon um, or evening. Goodbye.